Okay. Good evening. I tried to do... I just got out of the shower, sorry for the wet hair. It'll dry as we go. Um, I tried to do a one sentence at a time of natural law or the science of justice by Lysander Spooner. I used to have the book, but my meth head daughter stole it. So that's a whole other story. We'll get into that some other time. Uh, but I'm going to read this, and that's what this is, and i got to move my glasses, because they're in the way. Okay, so this is from, I'm pretty sure it's from Mises Institute. Natural Law or the Science of Justice by Lysander Spooner. Lysander Spooner has many great distinctions in the history of political thought. For one thing, he was undoubtedly the only constitutional lawyer in history to evolve, that's a key word, evolve, into an individualist anarchist. For another, he became steadily and inexorably more radical as he grew older. I, I disagree with radical. I think radical is a term that's overused, but whatever. From the time that Benjamin R. Tucker founded the scintillating periodical Liberty in 1881, Spooner and Tucker were the two great theoreticians of the flourishing individualist anarchist movement, and this continued until Spooner's death in 1887 at the age of 79. I can agree with that. That's gravy stuff. Spooner and the younger Tucker. Yep. Oh, by the way, t-shirt. Derek Bros. Holistic anarchism. It's in there somewhere. Consciousresistance.com. Spooner and the younger Tucker differed on one crucial point, though on that point alone. Tucker was strictly and defiantly a utilitarian, whereas Spooner grounded his belief in liberty on a philosophy of natural rights and natural law. I don't know, Tucker's pretty good, but I, I still think I agree with Spooner. Benjamin Tucker's a force to be reckoned with, though. <laughs> that guy, he's, he's wild. Unfortunately, Spooner's death left Tucker as the major influence on the movement, which quickly adopted the utilitarian creed while Spooner's natural race anarchism faded into the background. Uh, okay, I, I, get, I don't know who wrote this intro, but okay. Other than Mises. The present the present day followers of Spooner and Tucker in the United States and England have also forgotten the fundamental natural rights grounding in Spooner and have rested on the far more shaky and tenuous Tuckerian base of egoistic utilitarianism. Okay, okay, so okay. So whoever wrote this intro is clearly not a Tucker fan. Tucker's pretty badass. If you go to his site, well, not his site, uh, someone who's curating his works instead of a book, Tucker's pretty groovy. Uh, Lice, Andy, you agrees with Spooner and lots of stuff. Lysander Spooner published Natural Law or the Science of Justice as a pamphlet in 1882. The publisher was A. Williams and Company of Boston. The pamphlet had considerable influence among American and European anarchists of the day and was reprinted in three editions in the three years following publication. All right. Spooner meant the pamphlet to be the introduction to a comprehensive masterwork on the natural law of liberty, and it is a great tragedy of the history of political thought that Spooner never lived to complete that pro projected treatise. I agree. He he died before he finished it. It's it's a shame. Spooner Spooner's a treasure, man. Him and John Taylor got a treasures, and I don't even think Gatto's an anarchist, but he's a treasure for exposing public school for what it is. Alright, I digress. But what we have retains 
enduring value from the fact that of all the host of Lockean natural rights theorists, Lysander Spooner, that Lysander Spooner was the only one to push the theory to its logical and infinitely. Here we go with the word radical again. Infinitely radical. No, it's just its infinite conclusion. Individualist anarchism. There's nothing radical about that. I don't know why people like to use that word. It's so radical. It's not radical. It's logical. Those who are... It says those who are interested, but those who are interested in delving further into Spooner's exhilarating writings will be greatly rewarded by reading his No Treason and his letter to Thomas F. Bayard, published together under the title No Treason by the Pine Tree Press, Box 158, Largesburg, Colorado, and available for $1.50. Okay, you, you, we can find that online. Uh, the following is the complete and unabridged pamphlet by Spooner. His characteristic subtitle to the pamphlet was A Treatise on Natural Law, Natural Justice, Natural Rights, Natural Liberty, and Natural Society, showing that all legislation whatsoever is an absurdity, a usurpation, and a crime, which is absolutely true. All of it's a crime. You, you fucking statist, you can... Fuck you, you fucking fuck. Okay. My bad. I get a little off. Uh, the author reserves his copyright in his pamphlet, believing that on principles of natural law, authors and inventors have a right of perpetual property in my days. Okay, I don't believe in IP, but whatever. If Lysander did, he lived in the realm he was living in. So, here we go. The Science of Justice, Chapter 1. The Science of Mine and Thine. Oh, by the way, I've already tried putting out stuff like Sander Spooner's Natural Law one sentence at a time. It didn't get much traction, so I'm just going to read it. Y'all are going to get me reading it at you in one fell swoop, and that's that. Because it's literally like 15 fucking pages, so fuck off. All right. The Science of Justice, Chapter 1, The Science of Mind and Thine. The Science of Justice is the science of all human rights, of all a man's rights of person and property, of all his rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is the science which alone can tell any man what he can and cannot do, what he can and cannot have, what he can and cannot say, without infringing the rights of another person. Of any other person, this says. My bad. Strung it together. It is the science of peace, and the only science of peace, since it is the science which alone can tell us on what conditions mankind can live in peace or ought to live in peace with each other. These conditions are simply these. First, that each man shall do towards every other all that justice all that justice requires him to do, as, for example, that he shall pay his debts, that he shall return borrowed or stolen property to its owner, and that he shall make reparation for any injury he may have done to the person or property of another. The sick the the second condition is that each man shall abstain from doing to another anything which justice forbids him to do, as, for example, that he shall abstain from committing theft, robbery, arson, murder, or any other crime against the person or property of another. So long as these conditions are fulfilled, men are at peace and ought to remain at peace with each other, but when either of these conditions is violated, men are at war, and they must necessarily remain at war until justice is re-established. Through all time, so far as history informs us, wherever mankind have attempted to live in peace with each other, 
both the natural instincts and the collective wisdom of the human race have acknowledged and prescribed as an indispensable condition obedience to this one and only this one and only indispensable condition no obedience i'm sorry i got a little messed up obedience to this one and only universal obligation vis-a-vis that each should live honestly towards every other. The ancient maxim makes the sum of a man's legal duty to his fellow men to be simply this, quote, to live honestly, to hurt no one, to give to everyone his due. This entire maxim is really expressed in the single words, to live honestly. Since to live honestly is to hurt no one and give to everyone his due. 